Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We'll wait another few minutes to let everyone join. But thanks for being here for our last training session. Yes, so as you can see in the chat, as you're joining us, please uh, fill out the attendance form just so we know that we're that you're here and active in our training. Um, you can also join us on Sidekick if you already have an account. If you don't, we'll have a little slide explaining it in a minute. Okay, I think maybe we'll get started pretty soon, at least with the, at least with the introduction stuff. So, hi again. Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, and yeah, so I'm really excited to be here and to be doing our fourth and final training session, which is building connections. So we'll get started in a minute, I guess. Okay, how many people are there? Are there? We have, um, I think, 26 people currently here, which okay. is awesome. 25, cool. 26. Okay, so I guess I'll get started with the sidekick stuff. Um, so before we get started, I just wanted to talk about Sidekick, which is the platform that we've been using over the past <laughs> training sessions. Uh, to accompany us, like to help us with the training. So please click the link that has been put in chat to join Sidekick so that you'll be able to view like some resources that we're gonna put there throughout uh, this uh, training session. So if you already created an account at like a previous training session, um, you can just sign in as an existing user and you should see the training, the one for today pop up. And if you haven't created an account yet, but still want to join today, that's completely, that's great. Uh, you can sign in as a new user and be sure to use the email address that we've been using to communicate with you since that's the one that has been given access to today's uh, Sidekick event. Um, and yeah, so you can keep it open in like another tab and access it when we mention different resources. Um, there should now be, oh, let me put, there's a little game now that you can play if you, while we wait for people to get to join the sidekick and join, still join the Zoom. So you can go ahead and play that while we wait if you want. And again, if you're just joining us, don't forget to fill out the attendance form. There's a link in chat. There's also a link in Sidekick um, so that we know that you're here and active, present for our training session. Oh, that brick breaker is hard without a mouse. Yeah. <laughs> if you're not seeing the brick breaker game, click on enter event there. It is kind of hard. <laughs> okay, I guess, should we 
we'll wait one more minute and then we'll get started with the whole with the presentation just to make sure everyone is um, ready in the audio and zoom and also has joined sidekick Okay, so I think we will get started. So thanks to every, thanks for everyone who's here to join us for our fourth and final training session that will be building connections. We'll be giving you a bunch of like cool tips throughout this presentation to really help you be as prepared as you can be in the classroom. So here's a brief rundown of what we'll be doing today. So we have a few yeah, we have a few different topics. The first one will be how to build strong classroom connections. And this will have like a few different tips that really uh, we think can help you with yeah ha having a good relationship with the teacher and the classroom in general. Um, then we'll have some tips on connecting with students in particular. Then we'll go through a few scenarios that will be like some things you could experience in the classroom and we'll put you in some breakout rooms so you can discuss them and then um, discuss them here as a group so that you can you know be a little prepared know what you could do. And finally, we'll go over some recommended resources and do a Q&A. So here is our team. This has been the same one since the beginning of the training session. So uh, my name is Leah. I'm currently a program coordinator with uh, Engineers of Tomorrow. Um, there's also Spencer will also be helping me do the presentation today. He will, he'll be talking later so he can introduce himself then. Um, we're also joined today by Rebecca White, our CEO. Um, do you want to say hi, Rebecca? Hi, everyone. So excited to see all of you here. And I really hope you get a lot out of this uh, session today. And um, as always, we're here to help with any questions you might have. Cool. And we are also joined by Sarah Rishu, our operations manager. Do you want to say hi, Sarah? Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this fourth and final session. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time. And as Becky said, if you have any questions after this moving forward, please always reach out to us by email. We're here for you. Um, and I'm just so excited to see some returning EIRs today. Um, when you guys are in the breakout rooms, it'll be really interesting to hear your stories. And, and also, this is a, a bit of a new session for us. So I hope you get something new and different out of it. So thanks again, and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you, Sarah. That is great to hear. That's true. We will love, we would love to hear our returning EIR stories and just comments on our scenarios and stuff. So yeah. Um, okay, next slide, please. Okay, so we have a quote here for you guys as usual. So connection is why we are here. We are hardwired to connect with others. It's what gives purpose and meaning to our lives. So really, it is, it's the basis of the EIR program. You need you know, it's to connect with students, connect with the classroom. So we hope this will help you a bit get at least get started with that. Okay, so right. So oops, let me go to next. Okay, so we're going to start with some steps to for successful teacher connections and just classroom connections in general. So these tips come from our conversations with different teachers as well as EIRs. So these are really from like accumulated knowledge of participants of the program um, to try to help you start the year as prepared as you can be. So the steps are going to be a conversation about the curriculum, how to connect with the classroom, uh, having appropriate assessment, and the value in virtual connection. So our first tip is to have a conversation about the curriculum with your teacher right from the start of your partnership. Having like a good conversation about the curriculum early on can really help bring your visits to the next level. This can help in multiple ways, like helping you figure out how you can incorporate the full engineering process into an activity and not just talk about like the science facts, the science part. If you have the whole curriculum, you can also maybe identify parts where you think the engineering design process could be more easily like used. Also, another thing that 
good about the curriculum is that you can ask what the teacher's long range plans for science are, because they all they'll have the same curriculum right in a province, but each teacher may be doing it slightly differently, like having a slightly different order, putting more emphasis on certain items, depending on what they're more comfortable with. So if you know what their specific goals are, maybe you can help plan some activities or just at least know what is going to be happening during the year. Finally, try to find some common ground between engineering and education. There are actually a lot of things that are really similar, just with a different name than what we're used to. So it'll just be taught differently in like elementary and high school that it is in university and beyond. But there are really similar concepts in the end. Okay, so to go into a little more depth about adapting to the curriculum, here are a few extra things you can do. First, remember that it's not just science. The engineering design process is now actually a part of many curriculums across Canada. They may just be using different words than what we're used to. So if it is a part of the curriculum in your province, try to find out like how it is being taught so that you can try to make that experience even better. So I think that we put the link in Sidekick at least to the curriculum, uh, yeah, to the different province curriculums and it'll be available like on our website. Well, you'll be able to find it. You can always email us if you can't find it, but definitely try to like look at the curriculum for your specific province and see if it's a part of it. So yeah, next try to visit tactically. If when looking at the curriculum, you realize there's certain aspects you're like more comfortable or passionate about, try to plan your visits around when those are being taught. Remember, once a month is just our like initial target. So you could end up going twice in one month if you really like a certain topic or not at all another month if it's something you don't know super well or don't feel really comfortable in. But to, to continue on subjects you're not really comfortable in, um, make sure to work beyond your discipline. So try to show students broad engineering concepts that apply to multiple disciplines. So for example, a software engineer can still talk about design iteration during a structures lab. So like the concepts that they are being taught in elementary and high school aren't super advanced. So even if it isn't like your specific engineering area of expertise, you can still try to at least learn a bit about the topic at the elementary or high school level, and then just apply the engineering design process to it, which is what we're all experts in. So please don't be afraid of helping out with an activity, even if it's not like your engineering discipline. Okay, so next we're going to talk about connecting with the classroom. So first of all, remember that the teacher knows their classroom best. So try to ask what types of activities the class can be interested in. Are they really into like water, space, bridges? Try to plan activities around that. If you're unsure about if a certain activity could be of interest to that particular class or age group, just ask the teacher. They're really your main resource for uh, what will work well with their classroom. Okay, so our next tip is about appropriate assessment. So just to give you an overview of what we mean by this is that we want you to understand that the value, like what the value of these activities is for the students as well as for yourself. So the first part of this is understanding success criteria. So what success criteria is, is um, pretty much setting a clear goal for an activity. This is something that both students and teachers understand uh, really well. And this can make the whole activity go much more smoothly if they know kind of like ex what exactly they're trying to achieve. A broad challenge with a clear end goal is what engineering is all about. So try to incorporate that into your activity. Um, then understanding the value of iteration. So we know this isn't always possible, but planning to do the same activities two or three times can be a great learning experience from the, for the students. They can learn from their previous mistakes to make the next iteration better. So engineering is really all about iteration. So make them understand that if they don't get it right the first time, that's they can learn from their mistakes and try again. So kind of in relation to this, Remember that it's all about learning. So like I said earlier, it is important to set an end goal, but really like having the best possible end product isn't the main, isn't the main goal we're trying to achieve by these activities. So pretty much we're trying to help students understand the design process and learn from them from their experience. So make sure that the students understand that this experience is really about figuring things out along the way and learning and that the final product is not the most important part. So it's good to have an idea of what the end product should be. But if they don't succeed in like every aspect or something, that doesn't mean they failed the activity or anything. It was still a valuable learning experience. So finally, 
talk a bit about self-assessment as an EIR. So properly assessing your work as an EIR and receiving recognition can be sometimes a challenge. So try to acknowledge when something has gone successfully and what you've learned along the way. This can make working in a classroom environment even more rewarding. So really remember that you're doing valuable work and we want you to be proud of it. Because even if you don't get it all right the first time, that's all right, we're still, we're still all learning um, how it works. And just if you were able to put a little value into the classroom experience for the students, that's all that really matters. Okay, so now I will talk a bit about the value of virtual learning. So I know this doesn't necessarily apply to all of you if you have an in-person match, but it still could be an option sometimes. Um, if, for example, the school is like a little far from where you live, so you want to incorporate a hybrid approach and sometimes it's in person, sometimes online, or if there's a month where you're really busy and can't find time to come into the classroom but still want to contribute something, virtual can be an option. So what we want you to know is that there are different ways to connect virtually. The first, and I guess the most, like the first thing you'll think about is video conferencing, which is great for live events with students. Um, for video conferencing, we encourage you to use the platform that the school uses, since they may not have permission to like use another or it's just easier for them. Um, recorded videos are another great option if you want to teach them a certain concept or maybe you want to like show them around your workplace or something. Um, the advantage of this is that you can plan ahead and also share it with a lot of students. And finally, writing is also an option. You can answer questions by email and like have an email correspondence with the teacher who like collects the students' questions. Then engaging in virtual visits are still possible, even if it may seem like a challenge. Our tip for this is to start with a topic that will guide your visit. Then look for an activity like in our many resources or create your own. Try to have the teacher introduce the topic prior to your visit, which can also be good for in-person uh, visits too, actually, because then the students will be a bit familiar with it and maybe we'll have more questions to ask about it. And finally, after the visit, try to follow up with the teacher to know what worked well and what could be improved. So we now have a few tips on how to build trust with your virtual partner, since it can sometimes be a little challenging if you never meet them like in person. First, value people and use technology. Virtual team members need to feel valued for who they are and what they can contribute. Then make sure to be transparent and share everything you're doing so that no one feels left out. And a bit related to this last one, reduce uncertainty by being clear about your plans. So really just try to be as clear and open about what you're doing and share like any concerns. Also um, manage conflict, even though it can be a bit harder to do this virtually, which like, so pretty much if an issue comes up, try to like plan a time to go through it and to deal with it before it becomes worse. Then develop shared norms so that everyone is sure to have like the same rules and constraints. So another important part of virtual connections, which can also apply to in-person matches is avoiding feelings of isolation. The best way to do this is really talking by talking to each other. This is something we've said throughout the training sessions, really the first thing to solve any problems is to be open and to communicate well with your teacher because communication is really the best way to create a positive relationship and make sure that any concerns are addressed. Also, if it doesn't work talking to the teacher or there's something you don't necessarily want to talk to them about, uh, make sure to talk with us. Uh, we are here to support you anytime throughout the year. You can communicate with us by email or through other channels like Discord and your regional network. Then use the method of communication you are most comfortable with. This could be phone, video, email. We're very flexible and want you and your teacher to be comfortable. And finally, schedule some uh, check-ins. This is a great way to make sure everyone is on the same page and like of really taking the time to address concerns and to see what's going well, what's not going so well in the classroom so that you can improve for the next time. Okay. So now we have a little, we have this little slide that um, it doesn't really have to do with virtual connections. It's more just with connections in general. Um, so it's about what types of activities can you do when you're low on time? Because something I feel like the, like, cause the goal of our, uh, of the EIR program is to build a lasting relationship with a classroom. This means to have a continued presence, even during busy times. However, we understand if you're like really busy at work one month, you may not have time to actually like go to the school or like plan an activity. 
but there are, we want you to know that there are still things that you can do in this case to still have a presence that month. So some ideas of what you can do um, are first Q&A sessions, because this can take, uh, well, pretty much no time to prepare, right? You can just tell them to prepare some questions and then you go into the class and you can answer the questions. This is also a great thing to do in your first session. You can start by introducing yourself and like doing your engineering story, like we talked about in the previous session and then do like a little Q&A session if they have any questions about you. Um, then support the teacher on a project that they're already doing. So this is something that can be great if you just come into the classroom and they're already doing like an activity, but you can be kind of the like professional um, advice opinion and like help the students go through an activity. You don't really have to plan anything. You just have to be there, support the activity. Finally, if you don't have time to go into the classroom, you can send a recording of you, either like teaching a certain lesson or transmitting a message you want to transmit. Um, then you can also send them links to interesting YouTube videos. If you really don't have time to do anything, just Try to use, like you you know the field well, so if there's a specific topic that they're doing that, oh, you know some resources on, just send them to them and maybe it'll help them um, have a more interesting class on the subject. And finally, something that can work is to have like three words of the day that matter a lot to your profession, which this is a really cool way of like finding, an easy way of like finding an activity to build around that. Okay. All right, thank you, Leah. Um, we're now going to switch gears just a little bit. Uh, we're going to move into talking about how to make successful connections more with individual students. So, yeah, it should be it's good stuff. Um, so the first the first thing uh, that you need for a good student connection is trust, and we sort of split that into two more components. So the first component is character, and that's referring to your motivation humility, and ability to align your actions with your values. So consistency is really important in learning, especially for younger kids. So it can be really confusing and trust-breaking when you contradict yourself or can't explain your values and motivations. The second component of trust is confidence. And so we're referring to our ability to foster community by bringing both our professional knowledge and our own background. So the confidence to add little details, personal motivations for actions, and the context of decisions all those little things that you add in make it a lot easier to relate to and trust you. And also at the end of the day, both of these components really come through in communication. So it's the most important part of building trust. The second thing that you need for a good student connection is a sense of belonging. If a student feels like they don't belong in the activity or discussion, they just won't participate. We have a few strategies and things to keep in mind to try and help foster belonging in the classroom. So first, work on learning student names and find out what students are interested in. If you come in for a visit and you greet a student by name and start talking to them about something that they said they were interested in, they're gonna feel super special and it's gonna be a magical moment. Second, show your excitement. If you show that you're excited about your next visit, the students will pick up on that and get excited themselves. This excitement is what leads to curiosity and learning. Another thing to keep in mind is the importance of questions. So from a student's perspective, the goal of a question is just to get the answer. But as an educator, the goal of your questions should be to provoke thought and further discussion. I had a math professor in this last year who was a total expert at making hints into questions. And in office hours, he would question my proofs, poke holes in my stuff. And th what that ended up doing is leading me to discover something on my own. Um, where I thought of a problem in a completely new way and came up with an awesome solution and led to, and this ultimately led to a really good understanding of some basic concepts that I thought I knew, but apparently I didn't. <laughs> um, and it's just awesome to be guided to your own discovery. And it's just way more fun and personal than being lectured on a subject. And then finally, as we've said before, your teacher is your best resource for all things students. So debrief with them to try and figure out what you're doing right and wrong and just improve continuously. All right, so that's sort of all we have for um, general content so far. So now we're gonna move into our discussion activity. So we're gonna give you guys five minutes for each scenario and we've got two scenarios so that's going to be about 10 minutes total um, to discuss in breakout rooms uh, we hope that the breakout rooms will be about three to four people so once everyone has discussed privately um, we'll bring everyone back and then you'll all have a chance to share with the whole group if you'd like 
Um, we'd also really appreciate it if some returning EIRs have any thoughts that if they if you guys have any thoughts that you want to share, um, that would be great once we once we're all sharing as a group. Um, so before we do that, I'm going to go over our scenarios and also there's a PDF of them linked in Sidekick if you want to refer to them when we're in the breakout rooms. So for our first scenario, we have Rachel, who is a civil engineer paired with Paulo, uh, the teacher of a class of fifth grade students in Kamloops. So Rachel knows civil engineering inside and out, but this is her first time helping to teach fifth graders. So the two questions that we want to think that we want you to think about in this scenario are how can Rachel prepare for her first conversation with Paulo and how can Rachel contribute to the sense of safety and belonging in the classroom? And then our second scenario, we have Ricardo, who's an engineering student paired virtually with Claire, the teacher of a grade 10 class in Ontario. So the two questions we want you to think about for this scenario are how should Ricardo decide what to do for their sessions and how can Ricardo contribute to the sense of safety slash community and belonging in the classroom? All right, so I'm gonna open up the breakout rooms now. Um, I think the way I'll do it is that we'll have everyone be allowed to choose their own rooms. So um, everyone try to put yourselves in groups of three or four. Um, and if anyone stays behind in the main room, we can chat here as well. Um, and yeah. Have fun with this discussion, everyone. And you can take and, yeah. like pictures of the scenarios here if you want to, because I don't think you'll be able to access them in the breakout rooms. Uh, the, you can have them on Sidekick in a PDF. Yes, they are also them. on Sidekick. But yeah, I've just opened the rooms. So yeah, um, have fun with that, guys. And then once again, if everyone wants to discuss scenarios in the main room, I'll be here to discuss for sure. Um, and maybe maybe some of my colleagues will stay as well. We can have a discussion here. Yes, I'm staying here, so we can awesome. discuss the scenarios. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm just waiting to see how the breakout rooms play out. I think I'm gonna join one of the ones that has one. Yeah, go ahead. Spencer, can you move people? Cause there's one person in 12 and one person in 10. Maybe I can, can um, but I think uh, I think I'm going to I think I'm going to refrain from moving people because um everyone's putting themsel themselves in the rooms. Okay. I'll go over there to room 12 then. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I think I'm just going to really quickly get started and discuss a little bit on the scenarios in the main room. So I'm going to start with our scenario one. Um, and so I think really I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to talk about the first questionnaire. So maybe a good so a good way that Rachel can prepare for her first conversation is probably just to get started by reading the curriculum. Um, so as, as it says, uh, this is her first time helping teach fifth graders. So um, yeah, it would be good to start by reading the curriculum to see what they're learning in fifth grade. Um, and then also, this is something that they should be prepared to talk about in their conversation with Paul is talk about the plans for science um, and the curriculum in general and see sort of when the teacher wants to teach certain things and then plan plan the visits around that. So um, if there's a certain activity that needs to happen during a certain unit, then you know what time that's going to be happening at and you can plan for that ahead of time. And then mm -hmm. maybe another way to prepare is just um, Maybe in your initial emails, it's good to establish a good communication platform and sort of just be open and just try to just try to honestly just try to start by just being friendly, be nice, and figure out a great way to communicate. Because honestly, that's just the first step is just getting good communication going. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I think something else um, they they could do for that is. Also, like they can have like some activity, some ideas of activities, but also like they can't, they have to be sure to be open, right, to what the teacher will say. Um, it's good to 
you know, it can be hard sometimes if you have something you like really, really want to do, but the teacher may not think it's best for the environment. Um, uh, Rachel has to be like, okay with that and kind of be able to adapt to what the teacher thinks will work best, I guess. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, Cause yeah, I think obviously as the, as an engineer, it's gonna be a lot easier to come up with ideas for engineering activities than as a teacher. Um, but ultimately it is it is um, the teacher's decision at the end of the day. So just having those ideas ready and then being open-minded for sure is a good thing. Um, maybe on the on the second point for contribute to the sense of safety and belonging, um, for sure, maybe maybe just an obvious one for safety is just running the activity safely. So if there's if you're doing an activity and there are safety considerations, um, a great example is always electricity. Um, if you're doing a lab involving <laughs> electricity, you got to be careful not to get shocked, and that's just a basic safety consideration. Um, and just talking to the students about that and just telling them what the safety risks are of different things that you're doing um, and how to mitigate those, that um, that is obviously that makes things safer. And then also if you're if you're speaking to the whole group about a sh like a, obviously a shared safety concern that everyone has to worry about, well not worry, but everyone has to think about, um, sort of just being inclusive with that discussion and talking to everyone about that, that can also help with belonging as well, which is great. Um, and maybe more of a general tip for belonging is just talk to everyone at the same time, like don't, don't sort of exclude certain groups at a certain time uh, when you're discussing stuff. Um, it can, obviously, it is great to go talk to students one on one. Um, but if you're doing that, try to talk to as many students as possible. And when you're trying to talk to the whole room, make sure you're actually talking to the whole room and not accidentally leaving someone else, someone out in the corner. That's very true. I think really just, yeah, just try to be as like, I don't know, kind and open to everyone. Make sure they feel uh, like they belong. Because this is, for example, this one is like a fifth grade. Uh, class, which they're oh, more on the younger side, uh, you no, know, still elementary school students. So it can be, you know, it's just to be open and make sure people understand that you're, you know, you're okay with questions, you're okay with, uh, yeah, you just want them to learn and be there for them, I guess. And, uh, yeah, that's that's another yeah. thing is just being clear with students of just what your goal is, is your goal is just to help them learn and get excited about engineering. And so if they know that, it sort of sets their expectations and then, you know, they can they can totally be on board with that. And then like, so maybe if a student is like, what is this random person in our classroom trying to do? This is weird. But then if they know that you're just, you're just there to just like talk about your profession, then I'm sure a lot of students um, will just like, will resonate with that and they can get excited. Very true. Maybe we'll talk more about the second scenario now um, to answer the first question for um, how to decide what to do for the sessions. This really comes down again to that initial conversation with the teacher. Um, so with Claire here, just having that that first conversation, talking about the curriculum, bringing up some activity ideas, um, and then going through them and deciding what will be a good fit for the classroom and for the virtual environment. Um, of course, you don't have to decide on every activity in the whole year in one conversation in September. That's obviously not what we're trying to say. Um, but having getting some ideas uh, started there um, and even deciding for a date for your next conversation to follow up and decide on more activities, uh, that can be a good thing to do so that you can sort of continue that working relationship and continue um, continue planning stuff as you move forward and not just making one plan at the start and trying to stick to it for eight months, which can definitely be a bit of a challenge. That's true. That is, that is a really good point. I feel like also like this is a grade 10 class. The curriculum tends to be like a bit more packed. I think they're like in grade five. So really the teacher may have to like adapt at different times, right? They don't, you know, there's, there's changes throughout the year. They really, they have to get through certain stuff. So this one may be one where you have to do more like certain activities that are like more related to their curriculum for what the teacher wants or, but yeah, it really depends on the teacher. Maybe they'll have some extra time to, yeah, do whatever, but yeah. Anyone, so aside from Leah and myself, does anyone, anyone else in the room have anything to share for either of these scenarios? We'd love to hear it. Hmm. I see, Pat, you said about the new science curriculum. Yeah, I guess so. I don't really know. I'm not, I'm not in Ontario, so I don't know what changed for the Ontario curriculum, but no, for sure, we do have, so we do have links. Um, yeah, did you? If you click on our map of Canada here, it actually uh, opens up yeah. a PDF. In the, in the slideshow, has... once you, but no, for sure, we will be sharing links to like the new 
science curriculum. I don't know like what changed in it, but yeah. <laughs> I think there's actually more about like the engineering design process and stuff, right? If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I've, yeah I think it's really cool seeing um, how lots of curriculums, I think sort of generally in Canada, a lot of them have been moving towards the engineering design process, which is awesome. And as we said earlier, though, um, this actually came up when Leigh and I were talking to a teacher sort of as we were building the session. Um, we were talking to a teacher and like we were talking about an engineering term and they were talking about like a curriculum thing and they were we were talking about things with different names but then it turned out we were talking about the same thing and we were like oh like that's random we we were talking about the same thing but we sort of didn't know because we were we were using different words for it um and that was just a sort of a funny funny moment where we're like oh like we're all talking about the same thing here like everyone's everyone's trying to be on the same page and yeah it's just that they're using different language because you know it was probably one engineer that that sort of gave them these ideas and then a teacher just picked names for it when you know we have established names or even within engineering people have a lot of different names for the same thing so it's just yeah. good to talk about the concepts and sort of find some common ground there as we said words words are complicated there are too many they mean the same thing <laughs> but no with a good discussion it can be you can figure out like what what different people mean by the same or what different vocabulary people use for the same stuff. Maybe yeah, um, any... I'd like to maybe talk. Yeah, sorry. If anyone else has stuff to add, go for it. Oh, we can have a discussion too. Fine. And if not, um, maybe we can talk more about the safety slash community and belonging for the mm -hmm. virtual classroom. Um, this is definitely a tough one. I'm I'm honestly not really sure where to start with this. Um, but maybe a, maybe a good place to start would be to, again, making sure you're being inclusive and bringing everyone into discussions um, using inclusive language as well. Um, I know for sure for me, I've, I've noticed this a little bit is I, I, have a, I have a habit of saying you guys when talking to a group of people. And I've sort of realized that that's maybe not the best choice of words because that is that sort of does um, uh, disclude women a little bit um, and I but I still do slip up on that and that's just good to know um, so you can improve on things like that um, and then also um, with like safety and community it's like just also making yourself making yourself a resources a resource for the students um, if you sort of show yourself as like a, oh like I'm here to answer questions I'm just here like like you know use me I, I ask questions all that um, that sort of makes a little community of the students and be like, oh, like, let's go ask the engineer a question, like as a group. And then, you know, you get mm -hmm. this nice little community going on. Everyone feels safe and included. That's very that true. And I feel like another thing about, at least like about virtual, oh, did you bring people back? Uh, I did not, but I think I'm about to. Okay. We came back oh. over because we sort of had talked through both scenarios and we wanted to see cool. what you guys were talking about. Yeah, we just talked through the scenarios too. Um, we were on the virtual one. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to close the rooms now, so everyone should be back in about a minute. Cool. I hope you guys all had great discussions. Yeah, mm -hmm. we did. It's so fun for me. I have the breakout the breakout rooms menu open, and I can see all the little microphones moving. So I know everyone's having great discussion. It's fun. Um, And as you can see in our little, we put the little Canadian uh, map. You can, once you can access the slides, like after we'll have a link to the slides, you can click on it and it'll bring you to the, I think it'll download the Canadian, like the, we have a page that links to all the different Canadian curriculums for all the different provinces and grades. So, and it's also available in Sidekick already. So just if you want to get familiar with the curriculum of your province and age group. All right, the rooms are closing in about five seconds. People will be coming back. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, hopefully, hopefully I didn't cut off anyone right at the end there. Sorry if that did happen. Um, it is tough pulling everyone back from the breakout rooms because it does like it does just suddenly close. So sorry about that. Um, 
but yeah, I hopefully everyone had a chance to discuss at least one of the scenarios, hopefully both. Um, as I said before, I'm now going to open up the floor to anyone who wants to share their thoughts or maybe their group thoughts on one of the scenarios. And then again, as I said earlier, if we have any uh, experienced EIRs here who want to share their opinions as well, that would be much appreciated. You guys totally rock. Um, so yeah, who anyone would anyone like to share? I would be happy to share our conversation. Is that Go for okay? It. Yeah. Um, so we talked about the scenarios kind of more broadly and really just talked about the engineer going in and kind of humbling themselves and, and talking about experiences that the kids might have in the real world where engineering touches their lives. So one of the other people I was chatting with had a great idea to ask them, hey, how did you get to school today? Like, did you take a bus? Did you take a car? And then talk through those different ways of getting there. And, and then also just talking about how engineering can touch their everyday life in terms of things like, we talked about a future city class that went to a wastewater treatment plant. And, and um, one of the girls in the room works at Canada Post. And so she was saying, obviously that's a great real world example of something you can talk about. So just that idea of like, as the engineer, kind of humbling yourself and really, connecting with them and their community and their everyday life. Yeah, those are some great points. Like just, yeah, those are awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Becca, do you want to, do you want to share as well? I see your hand up. Yeah. Um, we had some really like cool practical tips uh, that we were talking about in our group. So one of the people in our group um, was talking about how um, they have a hard time with names. And I also totally relate to that. Like I am not someone that easily remembers people's names. And so for their first visit, one of the little small like engineering activities they did was to uh, make name tent card things. So to like engineer that and um and use your creativity so also then getting to talk about how engineers are creative and then you have the names there so you can at least like start to practice names I thought that was a really good tip yeah that's awesome do we have any any more people who would like to share their thoughts or group's thoughts on anything in particular Grace, I see your hand up. Go for it. Hi, hi everyone. So I'm I'm new, so I just want to start with that position. But um, just touching on uh, something Rebecca mentioned. So um, and I'm going to deal more with the the second question, which was, you know, similar for both scenarios. I think knowing people's names is like really important to people and getting their names pronounced correctly. So that's definitely one way to keep, to create a sense of belonging. And something we spent a little bit of time talking about in our group was this idea of um, the fear of failure. So as you noted in your slides, to really um, impress upon that this is a journey and that we're learning and um, that we'll learn from our mistakes and just to make sure that the kids are not afraid of, of taking those risks, right? To really get everyone to, to belong and feel safe in this environment. Yeah, that's a great point. And maybe one thing I'm gonna add to that as well is um, with the making mistakes and showing that that's okay is if you make a mistake, just admit your mistake. Like we all make mistakes all the time. And it's, if you if you make a mistake and then you t like tell you tell everyone and the students are like, oh, whoa, the engineer just made a mistake. But then they were like super cool about it. Like, you know, you're making yourself a role model. And then students realize like, oh, like the engineer is making mistakes and they don't care. So like, you know, we can make mistakes and like no one cares and it's fine. And so everyone is totally okay with making mistakes and just being open with that early on. I think is a great way of, yeah, you can just be super open and then makes it a great experience for everyone because they're safe to fail. So maybe one more call for anyone who would like to share more, but other than that, I think we're good to move on. Going once, going twice. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna move on now. So, Next up, we have a little bit of inspiration for you guys. So as this is the last training session and we're moving closer to the start of the school year, um, I hope that yeah, you should all start thinking about what you're going to do for the year. And 
hopefully uh, what we've got here is going to give you some ideas or inspire you to research a certain topic um, that you might not have thought about. I also want to give a quick shout out to Twitter, which is where we get these screenshots from. So we love seeing posts about this sort of stuff. And yeah, it's super fun to just look at these. Um, so first off, right away, we got some web programming happening on the left there. That's super cool. This middle class looks like it's a kindergarten class and they're talking about pitch and tone. So that looks really cool. And then on the right, we have an engineer who just brought in some tools and was like, okay, class, let's just like take apart some tools and look at them. And I think that's really cool as well. It's getting a great hands-on experience. We've also got some catapults and scientific method. I think I actually spoke to this EIR specifically, and I think they said they were iterating on their catapults and modifying certain parameters to optimize the perfect catapult. And I think that's really cool because, you know, catapults are, are super fun. And then at the same time, you can also talk about the design iteration and working through that. And you can relate it to some math and physics concepts as well, which is cool. Um, we've also got potato batteries. That sounds really fun. Electricity is always fun, especially for younger grades, because I think I feel like electricity always has this like sort of mystique aura where you're like, oh, like what's happening? Like, I don't know what's happening, but stuff's happening. Um, and I think that's really fun, especially with these potatoes. But then you can you can sort of if you can find a good way to explain what's going on, maybe chemically, but maybe at a more basic level. I know this is a big ask, but if you can sort of tr at least try to explain what's going on in these potatoes, you can be like, it's yeah, it's just like really cool and interesting. And I bet if someone gets interested in something like this, this you know, this is the path to chemical engineering if you like how potato batteries work. Spencer, <laughs> I I just wanted to say in our group we were talking about the how it's really rewarding when students have light bulb moments. <laughs> so you can <laughs> literally have some light bulb moments. Some actual <laughs> light bulbs turning on. Yeah, that's to that's awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've also got a class that did. A lesson on wind energy that's cool building windmills learning about different ways to make it uh make energy without harming the environment that's really cool mm -hmm. um, and about sorry about that one too that, that's yeah. another kindergarten class i think it may be the same one as before and i actually talked to another kindergarten uh yeah who was matched with another kindergarten class and they did something kind of similar they made like paper airplanes and were like measuring like well not really measuring but you know just seeing how they flew for you know which is these are really young kids these are like five-year-olds and it's still it's still nice to see that there are plenty of activities you can do really for all age groups. Yeah. Well, we got one more slide. Um, got programming in Arduino. That's awesome. I think I de definitely Arduino is a super useful skill. Like I've been I've been using that first year for um, for projects. And yeah, grade seven. That's fun to get programming. Uh, designing and building fan driven solar cars. Bro, these activities are awesome. Like. <laughs> So there's so, much I, there's so much variety in these. Can I just add on one thing I've heard a lot um, when you mentioned the Arduino and and in um, Spencer and Leah, you mentioned it earlier too, like don't shy away from trying things out if it's not your area of expertise and like you can learn right alongside the kids. And I just mentioned this specifically around coding and Arduino because that is something particularly um like in Ontario, that's been relatively new, introduced into the curriculum. So I know a lot of educators appreciate having support when it comes to that part of the curriculum. Can I just add something to that too? Um, a lot of schools have really cool like robotics and programming stuff available to them on Chromebooks. And in some cases, these items are collecting dust. And if you can go in and help them find fun mm -hmm. ways to these tools and resources that can be so valuable to the teacher because then they can keep doing it more in the future. Um, and I want to just mention specifically, like there's even a Minecraft education edition that I'd encourage you to look into if you're interested in doing some programming with the kids because they're all in Minecraft and they just mm -hmm. love it. And you can apply that to education, like talk about light bulb moments that can be really fun for them. And I think almost every school now has a 3D printer and they're way underutilized. So like if you use them to maybe make prototypes or like whatever, like there's, it's a good point, Sarah. There's resources you can tap into through their learning commons or even sometimes through the board, they can order in little kits and stuff. And we can provide lesson plans and resources there as well. Mm -hmm. So reach out to us if you need any tips on that. 
yeah, I guess this is something maybe we missed talking about earlier is for sure when you're talking to your teacher about the curriculum, talk about what resources they have available. See what like see what they have. If they've got 3D printers, that's super cool. If they've got Chromebooks, that's super cool. You know, figure out what they have and you can plan your activities around that as well and really utilize their best resources. So as usual, we have some recommended resources for you today. Um, first off, we've got our website, err.ca. The website has all of our latest and greatest resources in general, um, activities, ideas as well. We also have the entire EAR community. Um, that's middle team EAR. Uh, so please join the LinkedIn group or the Discord server if you haven't already, uh, and just start some conversations with people just talk. Um, and then finally, we have our YouTube channel where you can find tons of recorded webinars, training sessions, and other great videos. Um, as usual, all of these activities are linked uh, both in Sidekick right now and here in the slides for if you want to access them later. Um, and then, yeah. And so can I do a little plug for Discord? Yeah, plug Discord, um, go. <laughs> uh, so the other day, somebody posted on Discord, I'm not sure if they're here today, uh, that they would really love to have a, an EIR um, like PowerPoint sort of master slide deck so they could use it as a starting point. And I was like, great idea. I'm totally working on it now. So stay tuned for that. Um, a master kind of PowerPoint um, just with like the EIR branding on it. And we're putting in some links and like common maybe headings that you'd like to use. But that happened because of Team EIR because this person reached out on Discord. We saw it. We're like, great idea. And we're taking action on it. Mm -hmm. And also, one other thing is a sort of maybe a bit of exponential growth where once we have more people and people start talking to each other on Discord, it just sort of gets prolific from there and just people keep sharing and then it gets really awesome. So, so right now we're sort of in the early stages. So, get in right now. It's really important to just start these conversations and it just grows from there. So, we really appreciate everyone who joins and is active. We also have a bit of a bonus resource, um, which is us. We're your bonus resources. So we always love helping you guys, you people out. So please keep us in the loop. We can't answer questions or solve problems if you don't tell us. So please just please just let us know whenever you have you're encountering anything that you're not sure about. We're always here. And we also just love hearing about your successes. As you saw earlier, the the Twitter screenshots. We love hearing about all that. It's super fun. Um, as this is our last training session for the summer, we do want to thank all of our wonderful sponsors. And especially we'd like to thank Enable Education and Nick in particular for helping us access, uh, for helping us with Sidekick so much. Um, and also he's not here right now, but shout out to Luke Persaud, who was a teacher that helped us out so, so much when we made this training. So we'd like to thank him as well. Um, upcoming events. We only have one upcoming event left. It's crazy. Every time it keeps getting reduced. Um, and that's the kickoff event that's happening on September 23rd. As we've said before, we'll send out more information as the date approaches. Um, last one more thing is Leah and I will be around for two or three more weeks after today um, to keep supporting everyone through the summer. Um, but after that, we will be leaving for the school year. So at that point, please just reach out to Sarah or Rebecca. Um, as we won't be here. <laughs> um, and yeah, so thank you all so much for participating in all of our sessions, uh, whether that's live or by the videos. If you're watching the video right now, hi, video people. Thank you for staying and watching. Um, so I'm now going to open up the floor for Q&A. But as usual, you guys, you people are all free to leave um, as we are. We are done everything for the summer. Um, so thank you, everyone, and good luck in September. Thank you so much for everyone who joined us. It was really great hearing everyone's stories and questions. Big thank you to both you, Spencer and Leia. You did an awesome job with these sessions. Thanks so much. And we'll stick around if there's any questions. Yeah, and have a great rest of your summer, everyone. Mm -hmm. It's flying by. It is flying by. I can't believe it's almost August. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> Enjoy while we can. <laughs> uh, I have one question. Yeah, go for it. Uh, so uh, if you are making some sort of a prototype, you're going to take a prototype or 
making something that it need to buy some material. I wonder mm -hmm. if there is any process to reimburse the money. Yep. I think we covered that in, in the first session. So uh, we can send you the link. There's just an online form you can fill out. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. But is there a budget assigned? Uh, yeah. Yep. Uh, it's three hundred dollars, um, and sort of the details of what's covered and all that are actually right in that same link. We can maybe throw it up in the chat. Yeah, yeah. that would be good. Let's do that. Thank you. Yep. Or another thing that I would uh, want to add, Parisa, maybe we can ask our employers to, to support some of the costs. So try that as well, because I know I did it a few times and they were very responsive because this, when you're going there, you're not only representing yourself as an EIR, but you're putting Bell's name as well, right? Because you're an engineer and then Bell should be proud that you are dedicated dedicating time to to this, right? So try try that as well. Great point. Thank you for bringing that up, Reza. And if you do have an employer who is happy to support you as a volunteer and wants to get involved with us, sort of at a deeper level, um, just reach out to us and uh, we can connect with them. We have like, well, I think you saw the slide with all our awesome sponsors. So we love um, connecting with like-minded organizations and kind of syncing up in that really meaningful way. Mm. Thank you so much, Lisa and Rebecca. Thanks. You're welcome. Thanks for coming and taking the time. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions from those still here? Look at that. We're so good on our time. Almost yeah, pretty, exactly pretty in perfect. one hour. Amazing. <laughs> I was a little worried. I, I when I was looking at the timing, I gave everyone a little bit of extra time in the like breakout rooms because everyone enjoys that. That was good. Um, I, I then, we were having a really good conversation. But then I didn't that, realize because yeah. I looked at the time left on the step and sidekick, and I was like, oh, we've got time for five more minutes. But then I realized I was like, oh shoot, we were supposed to share like with the whole group in that time. So we oh, went over no, and I was like, good. uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, it's good. It's good. I think we're good. I think everyone's gone. Yeah, everyone left. That's actually yeah, the first you time can everyone stop left. Stop recording, nice. maybe. Yeah, I'll stop recording. Bye, video people. Thank you. <laughs>